talking about. It went, in this world we walk upon the ground picking flowers on the floor over hell. Yeah. You'd be amazed how far we could go with that conversation in relation to these paintings. Um, he was there, and of course I hesitate to even talk about this because I certainly am a foreigner, but he was there in the outback, and you know who lived there. There were aboriginals living there, and he understood very well what they were doing artistically, it seems to me, uh, and especially since much of it is symbolic, and David is a symbolic style painter. He's not going out there and trying to paint uh, you know, a typical Australian cottage by the sea. It's quite different what he's after, but it is Australian. Uh, and the, the year that he landed in Sydney, he'd already discovered a really important painter for him, and that was the very great painter, Paul Klee. And if I may say so, if you really look hard at the drawings there in the drawing gallery, you can understand how this temperament of David Rankin was drawn to somebody like Paul Klee. Uh, Paul Klee, I always tell my own students, the best advice he ever gave to any student was follow your own heartbeat, which says it all in one sentence. Um, but Klee and I think Rankin would have, by that time, he's 21, he probably acquired a, a book of Klee's work which would have included the very famous 1920, it's called The Creative Credo in which the sentence uh, that is quoted all over the place, art does not reproduce the visible, it makes visible. That covers most of the best artists that have ever lived in the world, and certainly it applies to, the, to what Rankin seeks in his work. And, and in that same creative credo, it's very interesting that uh, Clay gives this recital of things, and he talks about spots, dabs, planes, lines, etc., etc. He goes on for about three sentences like that. Every single which of which uh, Rankin was already experimenting with, and eventually made into a visual language, an idiom, which was you see right behind me. Those are not Aboriginal dots. Those are Rankin's mode of expressing something that he saw, a desert. And they are very flexible. They can, he can assign meanings to what looks to you like a dot. He can assign a meaning, and he has, in various paintings right here that you can see in the gallery in this show. Um, Now, going from the beginning through, and then you come to the most recent painting, which I believe is on this wall. It's called, and they're a group of works that he calls Elemental Union, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they are, I guess, the most abstract, but also the most concrete. <clears throat> uh, he really means something in those paintings, uh, which I think if you had a little less light on them, you'd see them better. Uh, the point is that as early as his 21st year, he was interested in Buddhism. And in Buddhism, you have the goal of becoming one with the universe. To become one with the universe is a very, very ambitious ideal. I don't have it, but I recognize the importance of it. But also, it's been referred to in other ways of talking about the visual arts. In most Asian countries, the principles are fairly similar, and most especially, of course, in China and Japan. And you find that they, are, they have uh, um, ideograms, 
which can be broken down stroke by stroke into something that we usually write heart slash mind, heart mind. Or you could say in Western terms, intuition and thought. Those are the two real ingredients. I mean, we have paint, we have canvas, we have everything, but those are the two real ingredients which you have to be alert to when you look at these works. Um, I wanted to mention one or two things also that uh, uh, I've known, a lot, as you can imagine, I'm pretty old, I've known several thousand painters in my life quite well. And they, they all shared certain things. One thing, first of all, they're visually, visually curious. Uh, any real painter is highly visual. Uh, and they look, and they look at other painters. And sometimes they are inspired by other paintings. Sometimes they borrow a, a line or a, or a form from other painters. Sometimes they do it consciously, sometimes unconsciously. He was very alert. I was astounded when I first started talking with David, when I first got to know him, at the range of his references to other painters. And in his early 20s, well, he was lucky because he came into his 20s just about when Australia was discovering that there's a great world out there full of painters. And I believe that the year he came to Sydney was the year that the Museum of Modern Art sent out a big show, a traveling show that got here to Sydney, I think. I don't think he saw it. It was just after you came, right, David? No. But, but just the fact that it had been there was enough, right? But, and, and that I took for granted that, you know, the, the, the quote, New York School was getting sent around because I come from a rich country and we could send it around. You know, there's a lot of money out there and they sent all these works around and built up this tremendous reputation. And of course, I'm not denying, we had some good painters, but so does every country. But these painters were very celebrated, and eventually you guys went, I believe it was the highest sum ever paid for a Jackson Pollock. <laughs> and that was big news in the United States. The Australians bought blue poles for blah, 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 I don't know how many millions, billions of dollars. So, uh, so he comes to his own in a period when there was great curiosity about painters outside Australia. And I remember we talked early on and he mentioned painters that I am very much involved with, very fond of, but nobody else gives a damn about anymore. And he knew them, he knew the work. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, William Scott, a wonderful British painter and in fact, there's just a brand new, very large, important study of his work, and he's probably going to come back into vogue. But nobody talks about William Scott in my country anymore. This guy, David Rankin, comes from the outback of Australia, and he knows about William Scott. How? I don't know. I remember he also knew about an artist that I thought was an extremely fine artist in France, and in fact, I once did an exhibition in New York that nobody even went to see because they never heard of him. And his name was Pierre Talcoat. This guy knew Talcoat's work. So I wanted you to know how impressive that was, how his curiosity is so great and he takes things seriously. And of course, the other thing is, uh, the other day we went, uh, I, I wanted to see uh, some work uh, of Ian Fairweather, who David had introduced me to. I mean, I knew the name, but in my country, as far as I know, I don't think I've ever seen a Fairweather on a museum wall. And we went and we did look. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know, Fairweather is just the cut type of painter hero that David Rankin would be interested in. And in fact, it turned out, as he told me the other day, uh, he made a pilgrimage to meet him. You must have met him in his very old age, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you think of Fairweather's biography, which I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I do know a bit. I know that he was all over the Pacific Rim, that he was in Shanghai and in Beijing, and that he, uh, that he um, wound up here in Australia. 
And it's, I think I remember that he wound up sitting in a very modest hut translating Chinese classics. Is that right, David? Medieval Chinese novels. Novels, imagine, imagine. A, a really important figure. And, uh, and David knew all about him and knew his work very well and admired it. And so I'm just telling you that this kind of painter has great curiosity, great visual curiosity, and usually is much more knowledgeable than the so-called art critics about what matters. So you should listen to painters. Um, he did, he struggled to find his own way. Now you think I've just added up several different kinds of experiences, you know, the Buddhism and William Scott and this and that and the other thing, Jackson Pollock, the New York School. He's got all those things to juggle in his 20s, and as did other artists. And usually a real artist wants to find his own way. And if I remember that David once told me about his father, who was not a very cultured man, and uh, he gave him good advice. His father was an ex-boxer, as well as a shoemaker. His father once said, never let a man lay his hand on you lay his glove on you, never let a man, another man lay his glove on you, which is another way of saying find your own way. And finally, this young artist, nobody did lay his glove on him. What you see is how he sorted out his experiences and came to his own voice, which by the way is never finished. No artist, writer, poet, anybody in the arts ever really finds his own voice. He dies looking still, as far as I know. Uh, and I don't think David will either. Um, <coughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about paintings in which the perspective tends to be from above, looking down. This painting, for instance, which is about, about a desert. It is not a desert, it's about a desert of some kind. You actually have the sensation, if you stay with it long enough, that you're above it looking down. Don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is not easy to paint. Very hard, very hard to paint. And it appears simple. It, this painting appears to be a simple painting, but it, this is not a simple painting. This painting really requires that you stay with it and study it closely and imagine yourself somewhere looking down on it, which maybe if I were an Australian art critic, I'd say, yes, and all the Aboriginal art is like that too. You look at it, you're really looking down on the ground, right? But I don't say that because artists all over have that possibility. There are many different perspectives that a painter can take including conventional Renaissance perspective, or what in New York they once called all over perspective, which I think is a ridiculous term, but uh, they thought they knew what they meant, uh, and, and so on. The, that with him, these things enter and leave. Uh, the early stone progression paintings in the two galleries down are related to this desert painting, but only in a intangible way. It isn't because he has these shapes that look like little stones or round things that they relate. And so much has intervened. So many other experiences has, have intervened before he painted this one, which is later that I, I, I just want to call your attention to that. He talks about things like deserts, rocks, stones, rain, wind, as well as imaginative things that have nothing to do with deserts, rain, wind, Australia, Sydney, or New York. Um, now, I want to just talk very lightly about a thing that David Rankin does that's very difficult and brave because uh, people are very critical of that approach nowadays. 
uh, he has an anecdotal edge in some of his paintings.